H2O World. Is everyone fresh? <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to keep it uh, short and exciting, hopefully. Uh, so let me just say thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I've had a long relationship now with, uh, with other people at Goldman with uh, H2O, and uh, it's been a productive and highly stimulating relationship, I would say. Uh, so uh, yes, my team is the central machine learning team, and uh, roughly, you know, we try to apply machine learning in the context of finance, wherever it can be applied, and it's kind of an endlessly fascinating, complicated, difficult, maddening, all the good stuff uh, endeavor. And so what I want to do is I want to give some platform or technology, even agnostic, problems that I consider to be fundamental at the intersection of business and maybe theory, if you'd like, uh, and in particular finance. So, uh, you know, my, my background is in pure math. I like kind of clear and fundamental problems that get instantiated in various ways. So I'm going to give you three of those. And in particular, let me, let me make clear, it's problems that I consider to be at the intersection of theory and, and business. And the intersection of theory and business is something that very much is in the surface and present all the time for machine learning practitioners uh, in finance. All right. So the, the first problem, and I, I think really it is kind of the fundamental problem in that in, in various guises when you try and do machine learning in finance or more broadly machine learning that involves time series is the problem of distinguishing non-stationarity from overfitting. And both of these problems basically have the same outcome and basically look the same in your data set or in your models, but solutions to them are very different. And this is why it's a very difficult problem and a very important problem to have a good approach towards. Uh, so just, just to, to kind of set the level with what I mean, so overfitting, of course, is when a model tends to latch on to the noise it sees in historical data and it selects these patterns and expects them to occur in the future. And of course, they don't occur because they're idiosyncratic and they only happened once. Uh, Non-stationarity, and I'm using the term broadly, not necessarily technically, is basically the property of a phenomenon which means that it follows cycles or trends and it is unlikely to repeat in the same way that uh, we have experienced it in the past. The weather, financial markets being kind of fundamental examples. So, I think this is something that we face all the time. Uh, you know, a model is not performing as expected or is not fitting as well as we thought. And is it overfitting or is there non-stationarity in the phenomenon that we're trying to model that uh, is affecting it? And, you know, you can sort of a level zero approaches, you know, uh, you can, if you think that uh, you're overfitting, you might apply some type of regularization. If you think that it's non-stationary, you may want to train, change your training regime and uh, cut down your training window or use a rolling window or uh, something like that. But there is really, at this point, there are approaches and there are techniques, but there is no real fundamental solution. So non-stationarity versus overfitting and distinguishing between the two, I think you know, that's one thing in finance and uh, applying machine learning to finance that uh, is going to be a very, a very important problem to solve and have good approaches to, and uh, more generally, in, in any risk-sensitive task that involves applying machine learning. Um, I just want to offer one uh, suggestion, somewhat cryptic perhaps, of a, a direction that I consider to be potentially fruitful for this problem, and that's uh, the encoding of categorical variables. So categorical variables, uh, can be encoded in various ways, and it's kind of a very simple thing that you do, but as with very m many simple things, th th there's still very many open problems related to it. And so time-sensitive encodings of categorical variables, uh, so something like target mean encodings where you have some kind of time sensitivity, I think that's an approach that could be promising in helping us deal with problems that where we don't exactly know if we're suffering from overfitting or non-stationarity. Okay, so that's one. The second problem is that I f believe we need to move, in my opinion, we need to move away from interpretability and into disagreeability. Let me call it disagreeability. Uh, 
and in a sense, you can think of it as a very strict sense of interpretability. We, we need what, what machine learning needs if it is going to be successful and applied uh, in, in uh, contexts that are risk sensitive, for instance, in finance, is the ability for people that are non-experts to disagree. So the point is not having something that is interpretable. And what I don't like too much about interpretability is that in some sense it, it refers to oneself. OK, this model is interpretable for me. Whereas disagreeability refers to the other person. So what I mean by this is that we, the models need to be such, the criteria for interpretability needs to be such, and again, in a business and finance context, right, that the other person can disagree with it reasonably without being an expert in it. And let me, let me actually make a clarification here, which I think is important, because I, I think in, in various discussions, especially in a business context uh, for machine learning, uh, happens and is, is a kind of a misunderstanding is, you know, interpretability shouldn't really be about domain expertise. So, you know, uh, stochastic calculus is uninterpretable to someone who doesn't know it. But that doesn't mean that stochastic calculus is uninterpretable as is. And, you know, the same applies to machine learning. Machine learning is not, a machine learning model is not uninterpretable when someone doesn't know machine learning. The, the worry is that, you know, uh, the worry that many people have is that machine learning or machine learning models are somehow intrinsically or irreparably, inescapably um, uh, uninterpretable. And you know, this is not the sense of interpretability that I have in mind. So we need to move from interpretability to disagreeability. So let me give you an example uh, based on a slight variation of a real life situation. Um, there was a model that, uh, that I had been exploring and it included a feature which was essentially morning or evening, and uh, the feature was one hot encoded. And uh, the, the people that I was discussing the model with were not machine learning expert by any means. Uh, and uh, one person in, the, in, this, in this group uh, disagreed fundamentally with one of the things that the model was saying, which is that something will happen in the morning as opposed to it will uh, happen in the evening. And you know that's what the model was saying, uh, so I you know, this was a disagreement that we were having not with, with someone who was not an expert in machine learning at all, but who was able to come up with something that, of course, is understandable to, to everyone, and that was a clear disagreement. And in the end, you know, we went back, looked at it, there was a bit, there was a bit of process. In the end, the human was right, actually. There was a, there was a, a mistake, a, kind of a, a bug, that uh, meant that what was appearing as evening was actually morning, what was appearing as morning was actually evening. And that, that particular incident in this particular context was fundamental in actually getting people to trust the machine learning model, not the opposite. It didn't have the, the effect of getting them to distrust it, it had the effect of making them trust them because they were able to disagree with it on kind of a non-expert level. So the, the reason why this had happened was because we had already made the model to be so interpretable to the point where we could point at individual features and uh, you know, measure uh, features, the, the contribution of each feature. So interpretability, uh, I think the, the, the criterion that will have more success in the context of business, in particular finance, will be disagreeability. OK, so that's two. The third one, the third, the third problem that uh, is a bit fuzzier and uh, a bit less well-defined, but I think is probably going to be more uh, probably more fundamental in the future, is the, more, is the problem of interpreting the life cycle. So again, interpretability is a, pro, is a property of a model, of an individual model, but really what we want to have is also to interpret the model life cycle. Uh, we don't just want to ask the model, what are you? We want to ask the model, where did you come from? And what I mean by this is that there's various choices you make when you construct a machine learning model, and once the model is in production, then there's various choices you make to develop it or change it. For instance, you might increase the dropout rate. You might add a certain kind of regularization. You might begin ensembling uh, when, when previously we were using only one model. Now, all these, all these transitions may involve models that we want to call interpretable, but these transi transitions themselves may be completely uninterpretable. And the reason why this is especially uh, stark, I feel, in the context of machine learning is because 
machine learning models are empirical models, right? They, they feed on data, if we have good data, they learn from data, and they potentially modify themselves based on the data that they see. So why do we ever change them once they're in place? Why do we change things like moving from non-ensemble to ensembled models? And I think there are various techniques that we use but there is no good clarity on the phenomena that these techniques are supposed to tackle. And I think this is kind of a general situation that's going to have to uh, develop and evolve in the business context uh, moving forward. So moving from an assortment of techniques to clarity on what phenomena these techniques are actually trying to tackle. Okay, so the three problems that I gave, uh, overfitting versus non-stationarity, uh, interpretability as disagreeability. That's, <laughs> it sounds, uh, uh, sounds slightly uh, worse than it is. Uh, disagreeability in a positive way. Falsifiability maybe for the more uh, philosophically inclined. Uh, so interpretability through disagreeability. And the third one, uh, where does the model come from? Not just what is the model telling us. So these three problems I think for the practitioner, for the machine learning practitioner, in, in finance, in the business context, uh, are already appearing and are gonna be very important uh, in the future. All right, and let me, let me wrap up. Uh, I said I'm gonna keep it short, hopefully exciting, uh, by saying that, you know, uh, H2O's motto is democratizing AI. Uh, I feel a, a less glamorous variant or a less glamorous sounding variant, which sounds more glamorous to my ear, is standardizing AI and Part of that is certainly being done by uh, things like driverless, for example. And the, the reason why I, I selected these problems is because they will all benefit from standardization. And it will be very interesting to see uh, to what extent practitioners using tools will be able to standardize approaches to these problems. And I think if that happens, then in, on the business side, and again, in particular for finance, we'll see machine learning uh, moving to the next level, so to speak. Okay, so that's it for me. Thank you, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I can take questions if there are any. I can't actually see anyone, but I'm assuming there's someone there. It's better than questions. Um, I'll come around with the mic. Very good, one here. That was a good summary, thank you. Uh, what's been your experience with um, business side, getting to know the storytelling from your team, how have you adapted over time? The storytelling? Uh, of the results, basically. You work on a model, you create a big project. Um, the early example you gave was excellent, you know, trying to bring it at a non-tech level so that the user could spot the error. But how have you evolved your storytelling over time? So by storytelling, uh, I understand uh, the, the, the results interpretation. The result, right. Look, I think, to be honest, for me, I, I'll speak for myself here, uh, for me. I'm just so excited, so incredibly excited when a machine learning model works, when the data is there and it works and it's training and it's in the data stream and it's producing predictions that, you know, I just feed on that excitement in how I present the model. That's, that's really the story. And I think, you know, AI and machine learning again, with a disclaimer in the context of finance, I think is at the stage where, you know, the storytelling really can feed from the originality of the successes. Um, so I haven't really thought deeply about uh, standardizing that part. Uh, so for now, the, the excitement is fuel enough, so to speak. Someone there? Uh, I think it was a good talk. Um, in addition to the three things that you mentioned, can you mention any specific challenge when it comes to the capital market markets implementation within the machine learning? Well, yeah, I'll mention one maybe, that uh, sometimes you don't, you don't have a lot of data. Sometimes there just isn't a lot of data. And uh, when you couple that with non-stationarity, then you get into this twilight zone of whether you should even be thinking about machine learning at all. Because if you combine non-stationarity with not a lot of uh, intrinsic data, then we're talking, you know, smaller data. And, uh, you know, overlay that with 
quality of data and things like that. Yeah, that's, that's definitely something we, we have felt. It was a great talk. Um, I have a simple question. How you bring machine learning and AI uh, into your CI, CD, and software development life cycle from your development to all the production? So what is your few, like, few cents on that, how you manage those at high level? On how to, on how to move, say, from the exploratory phase to, the, to, the, yeah, yeah, to yeah. productionizing? <sighs> Again, you know, Use H2O. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, look, uh, I think, if, if, you know, very, very good question, very difficult question. I think, f in my experience, the, the fundamental thing that needs to be in place is for, for the code that you use for exploratory data science or data analysis to be re reusable in productionizing the models. And that sounds easy in that, okay, you're, no, we're writing, you know, someone's writing some code, they just copy paste it into some production machine and then it just runs. But in practice, again, especially in the context of finance when you have risk controls, and model risk management, it's, it's not that simple. So I think having a platform in place that minimizes the amount of code that you need to rewrite when you move from the exploration to the uh, productionization phase, and I'm, I'm saying platform, right, a platform, because it's not about the code itself, that I think is totally fundamental. Time for one last question over there. Last question? Yeah, yeah, hi. I have hi. the um, fundamental question. For example, the AI model general case, the output is uh, randomly. How do you understand, how do you use, how do you explain in this situation? When, uh, I'm sorry, when the model is uh, random, you said? No, the output, the general case, oh. the machine learning um, algorithm, the output is uh, random. In general uh, case. How do we, okay, how do we know that it's not random or what do we do when it is random? No, in general case, it is random. It is not a random because you set the random seed. Oh, example, you, you, oh you, mean, you, mean, you mean when the model is trained based on some randomization? No, no. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not it. understanding the question, I think. The uh, algorithm, the machine learning algorithm output in each round, the what? output is different. What would be an example? Can you give me an ex a concrete example? Uh, for example, the autoencoder for the H2O uh, autoencoder, uh, you each round, the output is different. The, the reason is, is a constant because yeah. you set the random seed, so that output it is constant. Otherwise, the output is yeah. random. Yes, so I think that, that's an issue of trusting the training procedure. The, you know, there's a lot of randomized things you can do while training, like dropout, right? Randomly dropping uh, nodes in neural network. But no, 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 the, when the your model- No, 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 the is actually, it is, uh, what do we say, is uh, reduce overfit. But the, the, the come out and make the output of the model, it is constant. That, that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah, but at yeah, the end yeah. of the so day, the, it's a question of trusting your training procedure. So if you trust your training procedure, at the end of the day, even though the, the training runs are going to be different, you're going to end up with some fixed uh, coefficients, essentially, some fixed weights. And then, you know, then you can replicate your, your inference. So I think that's a question, if I'm understanding it correctly, look, let me say, dealing with a random phenomenon, if the phenomenon is truly random, then machine learning is just as worse off as anyone else, right? Uh, if the question is how do we have confidence when we use randomized uh, processes in our training, again, it's about trusting the, the training process, right? And exploring how it actually performs live. That's what I'd say. Thank you, Dimitris. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thanks.